page 95 in your hymn book. If not, it's on the screen, page one. Well, that's what it is. It's one screen one then, you know. Revive us again. Let's stand together and let's sing it to the Lord. Amen. We praise the old God. pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the night that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity, Father, to gather together to sing praise to you. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for loving us that you would send your son to die on the cross and do something for us that we can never do for ourselves, and that's to pay our sin debt. And so, Lord, we come before you tonight as blood-washed and blood-bought people, praising you, Father, for the salvation that you've given to us. We pray, Father God, you might fill us with your presence and your power and your spirit tonight that we might learn from your word, Father, and take that word with us and then share that with those who need to hear it the most. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do tonight. We look forward to it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you very much. Let's take a minute before we sing again to have a testimony or two or three or four. Surely God's people are glad to be here tonight. Amen. Surely God's people are glad to be here tonight. Amen. I said, surely God's people are good to be here tonight. Amen. We're glad to be here tonight. Good anyway. Yes, young lady. And her family. Yeah, and her family. And um, another little gal told me today that the Holy Spirit, and you probably already know this, but she prayed for what I call healing kids because she heard about five of them, and I don't know that any of them are actually living. All right. <laughs> easy now, easy. Well, you know, those fellows, you know, they've been working over there and kick it for months and months and months. And a lot of times you don't see a lot of fruit from what you do. And so it's really good to see somebody like that who makes that decision. You know, we had a, the Williams family was visiting with us again today. And I was talking to, his name is Johnny, her name is Kim. I was talking to him, and uh, he grew up down where my parents did, around Marsh Fork, Clear Fork, in that area. And he asked me if I knew this guy by the name of Jerry Swanson. And I said, yeah, I know Jerry Swanson. 
Uh, when I was, came to West Virginia, I preached at Weissville First Baptist Church. The pastor gave me an opportunity to preach there. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not sure I know what I'm doing now, but he gave me that opportunity. And uh, Jerry was impressed because I had left my job, quit my detective job, and left the police department and stepped out in faith. And that made an impact on him. He was the vice president for coal mine. And so I would get money from him every month, and I would get a Christmas bonus from him as he got what he would give me one, too. I didn't know who he was for a long time. You know, who's this guy? Anyway, so I met them, and, and uh, he asked me, he says he lives over here at, at uh, Flat Top Lake, 174 Flat Top Lake. <laughs> so, uh, hey, there's another somebody to visit. Yeah, that's exciting. Phyllis, are you pointing at something? That's good. Yeah, I've been to his house, the Williams house, yeah. Uh, they didn't let me in. <laughs> probably because they weren't home. That's probably why they didn't do it, you know. I said, did you get the flyer put on your front door? I knew they didn't because you could tell they didn't use their front door, but I didn't want to go on the back doors and stuff like that. You get shot doing things like that. And he said, no. I said, well, I want that back, <laughs> you know. But anyway, pray pray that the Swanson family come, you know. It's, I won't get into the whole story, but... Uh, Apparently he's not in church. He needs to be in church, and that would be wonderful if he would come. Somebody else give a word of testimony tonight. I talked to Susie. She knows this lady Nestor from Georgia. She met him the day today. Um, she went back to the doctor the next day. The kind of cancer she has is incurable, she says. And uh, as we had said, Mike is. Yeah. Your Michael is. Right, Michael? I know, but you can still hear me. <laughs> We'll see what we can find out about that, yeah. Hmm. She always prays for people. Yes, she does. She, she wants the prayer list. She wanted the Wednesday night prayer list that gets mailed out and stuff. So uh, she thinks about us all the time. It's interesting that she knows that she's not going to survive this cancer, but she's concerned about praying for other people. Yeah. And that's the attitude that we should have. That's a wonderful attitude. Anybody else? Amen. You know, I don't know if you know about it. If you weren't here on Wednesday night, we had been praying for Alan, uh, Nikki's brother, who, well, technically, I guess he was dead, and they brought him back, uh, at least physically, uh, from death. And uh, we prayed, when I first heard about it, I prayed that God would bring him back to life and give them an opportunity to witness to him because he wasn't saved. And that's exactly what's happened. He returned home when they never thought he'd be able to go home. And... Uh, Wednesday night, I think it was, Nikki was talking to her brother and said, you need to go talk to Alan now because they live in the same house, I guess. And Alan went down there and led him to the Lord. I should say her brother led Alan to the Lord, and Alan said the sinner's prayer. And so that's an answer to prayer. That's how we were praying. You know, we don't think things are going to happen because we don't believe things are going to happen. You know, you have to pray believing, and that's the key to it, I think. And that's a marvelous answer to prayer there. It just really is. So pray that it's true faith is really true faith, and pray that there is a uh, growth in his life. Amen? And so pray for Kick It, too. A lot of good things happening over there with our people. Somebody else? Let's sing one more song, 495 in your hymn book. On screen one, screen two, or if you turn around and see it on screen three, take your pick. 
I know who holds tomorrow. And then we'll go right to our classes. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine. Though its clouds may turn to gray. I don't worry for the future. For I know what Jesus said. And Amen? All right, let's go ahead and split to our classes. Thank you, Dwayne, for teaching. Do you want to have a pep rally? High five. Let's go. Let's go at it. Let's go at it. That's right. Let's go at it. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Please don't <laughs> How can I be moody unless it's not on? It was off before. That sounds good, though. I think it was, Mike. I'm not sure. <laughs> now, I was going to talk about repentance tonight because here's a good illustration of it. A change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. They sat in the back, but they changed their mind and moved up front. He's a follower. All right, huh? <laughs> and Gary, I guess you guys can go out together, you know. <clears throat> I'll leave you alone. That's good, huh? You like that? <laughs> Open your books 
your Bibles to the book of James tonight. <clears throat> now, the emphasis on the book of James is what? Does anybody remember? Spiritual maturity. That's what the book is written for. God wants us to grow. So James writes this letter to the churches and the people in the churches that were scattered because of persecution that we see probably back in Acts. You need a cough drop? I can give you a... I'll wipe it off for you. Will that help you? Any port in a storm, brother. You know what I mean? It's holy water. It's good. I'm a saint. Oh, she had one. John would always have one for you if you needed one. The idea is being spiritually mature. And tonight we want to talk about one of the things that keeps us from being spiritually mature, and that is self-deception. We see that a lot today. Let's just go back and review just for a minute what we've looked at so far. James talks about, first of all, trials that come into our life. God brings trials into our life to make us stronger Christians, not to lead us into sin. God brings tough things into our life that we would rely upon him more. And he gives us three imperatives, three commands as he begins this letter in chapter 1. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. And then he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. You get stronger as you go through those trials. And then he says, and let patience have its perfect way in your life. Let is the idea of willingly allowing God to control aspects of your life. We wrestle with that all the time because we don't like someone outside of ourselves to control us. We don't like somebody outside of ourselves telling us anything, what to do or how to do it. And what James is saying here through the inspiration of Scripture that we should desire God, let him into our lives that he may produce in us the things that he needs to produce in us to make us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see that there in verse 4. And then it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So we are to count. We are to know. We're to let. That's volitional. It's a choice that we make. And then the last one is to we are to ask. Now, you think about asking. What's the first thing that pops into your mind when you think about God and asking? Prayer. <laughs> because that's exactly what it is, right? You're asking God for something. And so these are things that helps to make us spiritually mature. And we don't count it all joy when we fall into various trials and tribulations normally, do we? It's, oh, me. All these difficult things are happening to me. And we don't look at it from the perspective knowing that God is working a, a wonderful thing in our life to make us stronger, to make us more Christ-like by allowing us to go through those things. And he does that. We're not, we don't allow him to come into our life because we try to deal with it ourselves. When you have a trial or a tribulation in your life, what's the first thing that you normally do? Do you normally go to God or you try to solve it yourself? In most cases, you solve it yourself. But as you grow maturity, I saw a couple of you shaking your head, you go to God first. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Amen? Amen? Yeah, that means you agree with me when you say that. That's a good thing. And then asking. Ask for wisdom. You know, not that you're ever going to find out why you're going through that but wisdom to know that what you're going through is good for you. Does that make sense? And so there again, there needs to be that communication with God. He has to be real to you. That's spiritual maturity. He has to be real to you that you trust him, that you know that he's bringing these difficult things into your life for a purpose. And so he begins this letter by talking to us about trials that God brings into our life. But also through trials comes temptation. Temptations to do the opposite of God's will, and that would be sin. And he defines it for us here. He says in verse 14, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. God doesn't tempt anybody with evil, it says in verse 13. And God can't be tempted with evil, so God doesn't tempt us with evil. Who does tempt us with evil? We always say the devil, right? Satan. And we go back to Flip Wilson back in the 70s. The devil made me do it. But what's it say there in verse 13? 
our own desires. And so the trial has come into our life, and it's how we're going to deal with that trial. We're either going to go God's way or our way. We go God's way, it's good for us. It helps us to mature. We go our way, it leads us down the wrong road. And he begins to define this road for us. He says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And we talked about what that meant. The idea of, of a fishing lure. You know, you sit down there and just kind of get that fish coming up. You tempt him. It's just like an alcoholic walking by bars all the time. Oh, I don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to succumb to that. But why is he walking by bars? It's anybody who has these type of sinful desires. Why lead themselves in the wrong road? And then he says, and when that desire has conceived, verse 15, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, verse 16 is where we're going to pick up today. And then we're going to skip down to verse 19, because verse 16, I think, is the, the key verse to the entire chapter, if not the entire book. It says, don't be what? Deceived. Don't be deceived. Because we can be deceived. Uh, look at verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving who? Yourselves. And so we can deceive ourselves. Look at verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, how many of you have trouble with your mouth? I mean, you know, we have nice teeth, you know, and all these things. You know, the ladies make makeup and lipstick, and they look really, really nice. But we say the stupidest things sometimes, don't we? I told you at the police department, they called me Matt the Mouth for a reason, and it wasn't a good reason. If I had something to say, I said it. It took me 30 years to learn that I didn't have to say it. Actually, I don't even have to think it, but it took me a little bit longer to get to that point in my life. And so you have to remember that you can deceive yourselves. And here in verse 26, it says, uh, but if he doesn't think he's a see. If anyone among you thinks he is religious but doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart. And so you can deceive yourselves and you can deceive your... What's it say in the verse? Verse 26. Say it again. Say it again. You all have to participate. It's your heart. You want to sit over here? Okay. Yeah, it's all right. And so we can be deceived... By our desires, we can be deceived by our hearts. Let me tell you another way we can be deceived. Look at Matthew chapter 7. And you know these verses as well as I do. Verse 22. Let's go to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so you can have people that are deceived by their own desires. Their heart is deceived, and they have... Here you have people that are deceived into thinking that they are saved when they are not saved. Let me think about that. You've heard me say before many times, I would suppose now after years, Carl Johnson believed that only 10% of the people in churches were born again. And that was probably back in the 90s and the 80s when I heard him say that. Uh, Carl Johnson was a local evangelist. He wrote a lot of books. He used to teach at ABC and had a bookstore, the bookstore that's uh, in town, the, the Beckley Bookstore whatever the name of it is, he's the one who started that years ago. Used to be up where the laundromat was years ago that I remembered. But that's funny that here's this guy who goes to all these different churches and preached for 50, 60 years, believe that the vast majority of people in our churches are self-deceived into thinking that they are born again when they're not born again. And look at some of the things that they were doing. They were prophesying in his name. They were what, doing what else? What is it? Casting out demons? Would they seem like spiritual people? But what was their problem? What was the problem that Jesus said? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. 
I never knew you. And what is eternal life? It isn't living forever. That's an aspect of it, a fringe benefit of it, if you would. Eternal life is having an intimate, personal knowledge with God. And you know that from John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so they didn't know Jesus. They didn't have eternal life. So they did things in his name. And we're going to see at the end of this, this chapter that a lot of people do religion or religious works that are empty and useless. And I think that's exactly what they're talking about there. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus is speaking to the Laodicean church, and he says, I am rich, this is what they were saying, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now that's a church saying, hey, they have everything. They have everything they could possibly want. I have need of nothing. And then Jesus goes on to say that you have nothing. You're poor. You're empty, and you have absolutely nothing. And so here you have to understand that you can be self-deceived. You can be self-deceived. Spiritual maturity results from a proper relationship to God through his word. Because in the next part of this chapter, he begins talking about the engrafted word, how important God's word is to us. It's everything to us. It's the beginning and the end of who we are. Why do you think that God's truth is important when it comes from the idea of not being self-deceived? Yeah. God's word is what? Truth. And if God's word is truth and we're looking at God's word, will we see the self-deception that's there? He talks about looking in the glass, looking in the mirror in a minute. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You're looking in the law of liberty. God's word is truth. And if we're rightly related to God's truth, you cannot be dishonest and you can't be a hypocrite because you're going to be convicted by what you see, convicted by what you hear. So let's look at three responsibilities that we have that James tells us that we have toward the word of God and how that helps us in our walk with the Lord. It says, so then, verse 19, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is what? Able to save your soul. And so there was a time in our lives when we were filled with all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. But the Lord spoke to us, amen, and he cleansed us, did he not? How did he cleanse us? Through the word of God. True? Hello? <laughs> How do you put up with him every day? Pretty tough, isn't it? I didn't say you didn't, did I? Do you want to come up here and do this? Well, come on. It's my turn to sit down this time, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus told a parable of the soils. You remember that? The soils. The soils. Sometimes they call it the parable of the sower, but it's a parable of the soils. Four different soils. The first one fell on rocks. You remember that? These are people who didn't receive the word of God at all. They just didn't get it. And then you have the, the people that it landed on soil that wasn't very deep. Shallow-hearted people. The sun came out and burned it up. Then you have a, people who had trials and tribulations that to receive the word of God. It says they received it with joy, but then trials and tribulations came and it went away too. That's a crowded heart. But then you have a fruitful heart, a fruitful heart. People who heard the word, it says, and did the word of God. And by doing the word of God, they were fruitful. How do you know that you have received the implanted word of God that leads to salvation? by the fruit in your life. Salvation is always marked by fruit. Always marked by fruit. That's just, that's just how it is. Uh, that's the final test of any salvation. How do you know if people are saved? By the fruit that they have. You know, If something is alive, will it not grow? If something is dead, does it grow? No, it doesn't grow. But things that are living grow. Things that are living change. Things that are living mature. 
And so what kind of fruit should we have as Christian people? If we're going to be saved people and we don't want to be deceived and we want the implanted word of God to begin to change our life, and as it changes our life, what is the type of fruit that it brings into our life that we can know that we are truly born again? Isn't that a good question to ask? How do you know you're saved? You can deceive yourselves into thinking that you are saved, right? We can deceive ourselves, it said in verse 22. Our hearts can be deceived. We looked at Matthew chapter 7. We can even be deceived about our salvation. So how do I know that I'm truly born again? How many of you are saved? How many of you know so? How do you know so? What's that, Nelson? Can't hear you. I hear you. You nervous? Grace, but that's what I've received. I received grace. I received mercy. But how do I know? What, John? By the life I live and by the fruit that I bear. What type of fruit should I bear that I can know that I'm born again? If you have a lot of people who are in church thinking that they're saved, Jesus says, in that day many will call me Lord, Lord. Master, Master. And you'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you never knew me. And for him to say that, you know, it says many go in thereat. The gate's wide that leads to hell. And the gate to salvation is what? Narrow. And few there be who find it. So how do you know you receive the implanted word of God? How do you know you're born again? Because that's the first step into spiritual maturity. You cannot become mature until you're what? Born. I said this morning, you got to be born twice. If you're born twice, you die once, right? If the Lord tarries. But if, you, if you're not born again, how many times will you die? Twice, physically and eternally. So how do you know you're saved? People always come up to me and they say, I'm, I'm in church or I go to this church or that church, but what type of fruit do they have in their life? I got some here for you. I got some verses. If you want to write them down, I'll give them to you, but I'm not going to look them up for you tonight. One of the fruits that we have in our lives and know that we're saved is we have a desire to win souls to Christ. The Great Commission tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We have a desire to obey God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? And so one of the fruit that we have in our lives because we have received the implanted and grafted word of God is we want to see souls saved. Now, if you don't have a desire in your heart to see souls saved, then maybe you are not born again because you're not obey, uh, obeying the commandment of Christ to keep his commandments. Another one is, uh, that's Romans 1.16. Romans 6.22. We should be growing in grace. As Christians, you're always growing, always changing. People shy away from this concept of, of change. Change is a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. Babies change, don't they? I mean, all of you were babies at one time, physically, and you've changed. You were cute when you were a baby. I'm not going to say nothing else. That's safe, right? But then we change, right, into toddlers and then little kids and then bigger kids and bigger kids and bigger kids and here we are today there's growth in our life one of the signs that you're spiritually alive is there growth in your life are you the same now that you were 30 years ago 40 years ago 50 years ago that's a sign maybe that you don't have that fruit of growth in your life having a godly character Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you are Christ and you're yielding to Him, right, let, and you're asking, He begins to take you and mold you into the very image of His Son. And when He does that, you start to exhibit in your life spiritual fruit, the fruit of a godly character, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meek, all those things that make up the fruit of the Spirit begin to manifest themselves in your life because God is taking you and is molding you into the very image of Christ. 
that's a sure tell sign that something has happened to you, right? We have become new creatures, new creations. Just as God created the world, He's recreated us into something that was alive that had been dead. And so we have a godly character. G good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For God saved us, right? Why did He save us? Unto good works, which He hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so God saved us for some works that He has set aside for us to do. What are some of those works? We just talked about some of them. Talking to people about Jesus, winning the souls to Christ. Hey, let me just tell you something about winning souls to Christ. It's the lost art today. You know, do you ever get up in the morning and say, I want to lead someone to Christ today? Lord, give me someone today that I can talk to about Jesus. You know, you have to get that frame of mind where God is going to use you as a vessel of righteousness for his glory. We're always willing to be vessels of unrighteousness, allowing ourselves and our own desires to penetrate, right? And we don't do God's commands. But wouldn't it be wonderful for God's people to say, Lord, use me because Jesus is coming soon. And maybe this is the only time I'll ever have to lead someone to Christ. And the average Christian never leads one person to Christ. Never leads one person to Christ. That's an amazing statistic, don't you think? He said, well, I don't believe that. Well, here, let me just ask you. Don't raise your hands, but how many have led someone to Christ in the last year, last two years, last three years? You see, you can kind of get a measure of where you're at spiritually a little bit by that. So good works. And let me give you one more. It's uh, praising the Lord. Ephesians, or Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Man, when you're saved, you're excited. I didn't come this way naturally. I get excited about the Lord, don't you? Now, I don't care what you think about me. Well, I do. But that's your problem. I have a good time in the Lord. And should you not? I'm blood washed, blood bought. I'm going to die someday. It may be terrible. It might be horrendous. But I know where I'm going. Because I know whom I have believed in. And I'm persuaded he's able. Able to what? Keep that which I've committed unto him. He can do that because he's God. And so remember, we're talking about certain things that God is bringing into our life through trials and tribulations. And we don't want to be deceived. We need to see these fruit in our lives. Because religious works can be fabricated. And they don't really have any life in them. Real fruit always grows. Look at John chapter 15 just for a second. This is the chapter about fruit. I like fruit. Hi, Aubrey. How you doing? Amen. It's always great to wake up alive and not dead. But unless you know, if you know the Lord, that wouldn't be so bad, would it? John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do what? Nothing. So we go from fruit to more fruit to later on much fruit. One of the signs that we see is that there's fruit in our life. Increasing fruit in our life. We have communion in this church every month, don't we? And that can be just a religious ritual. Because at the end here in the chapter, I think it's verse 20, uh, back in James, it starts talking about religion. True religion is this, he says. Pure and undefiled religion before God. The Jews practiced the religion, did they not? They sacrificed sacrifice after sacrifice to God. How many times do you think their sacrifice was just an empty ritual that they did? 
How many times when we have communion is this just an empty ritual that we do? I think a lot of times it is. A lot of pastors just tack it on to the end of the service, right? We've got to have communion, so, you know, we're done, so let's have communion. Let's remember this. You have, you have a question or is your mouth open? He does that all the time? Yeah, it's okay. I understand. And so you can, you can manifest religious works that have nothing to do with anything, right? So you're deceiving yourself because you think those works are going to give you favor for God, and they're not going to give you any favor at all to God. The only thing that gives you favor with God is His grace because you have nothing to offer Him, nothing at all. And so when we have communion, you just need to sit there and just praise God because you have nothing to offer Him, because you have nothing that He really wants. He saved you because He loved you. He saved me because He loved me. There was nothing in me that He desired, nothing that in me that He wanted. But He gives me grace. He gives me mercy. And so when God tells me to, to love Him, man, when I have communion in my hand, it means something. You know? You have to walk with God and make Him real in your life for that to be true. And we can go about doing any, anything like kick it. We can go through the motions of teaching these kids and teaching these kids, and, and it's just that. You're just going through the motions of teaching these kids what? Things in a book that has no value, no life, no, no power to it because it doesn't have power in your life. This religious emptiness. The Jews had religious emptiness. So don't you think that we can't have it today because we can. We come to church in the morning. We sing a couple songs. The choir sings to us. You know, they come and they sing a couple of congregational songs. I preach a message. We have a special. Right, Joe? You were here this morning, weren't you? I heard that young guy sang a good song this morning. But I don't know who he was. He didn't come back. Yeah. Oh, you sang this morning. That's right. That was good, by the way. But you see, we are so good at deceiving ourselves into thinking that we are so good at what we do. we got every program that can be offered to do anything that we want it to do. Our children's church, our, our middle-sized church that we really don't have anymore, our super church, our kicket programs, our deacons, our trustees, our, all the different, you know, committees that we have. We got, we got something for everything, right? But you have to be careful that you just don't have something to have something. Does that make sense? Because when you do that, you're deceiving yourselves. You're just like that church at Laodicea. We're good. We got all these things and we have need of nothing. But what we need is God. The church at Ephesus, they lost their first love. He said, repent, go back and do the first works again. Get excited about God. Get excited about who He is. Be looking for Him. Even come Lord Jesus. And so we have to be careful that we receive the Word of God in the right way. Because when you receive it, receive it in the right way, it begins to work in your life the way that God intended it to work in your life. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, take heed what you hear. So it's important to what you allow to come into your ears to infiltrate your mind because that begins to change who you are. In Luke chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible says, take heed how you hear. You know? Sometimes you can just hear sermon after sermon after sermon and it does absolutely no good at all. You know? You just sit there and you listen, and then when it's over, it's over. And you go home, it has no impact on you. That's true in everybody's life. True? Sometimes Monday, I know I'm tired, but what did I preach yesterday? You know, if I have trouble remembering, I'm sure other people do too. So we take notes sometimes about what's being said so it can mean something to us. Take heed how you hear. Because there are some people, it says in Matthew 13, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So hearing they hear, but then they really don't understand. And so you can become dull of hearing, and you're deceiving yourself. And so you're never going to mature. <coughs> you're never going to become what God wants you to be. Because if you're not hearing the word of God correctly, it begins to decay your Christian life. And there's been people in church that have been saved for long periods of time. <coughs> they have very little fruit. 
very little growth. And over that long period of time, they deceive themselves into thinking that everything is hunky-dory. And really, things aren't hunky-dory. They just deceive themselves into thinking that. And that Satan likes that, doesn't he? He wants you to continue going down the road you're going. That's exactly where he wants you to go. <coughs> he doesn't want you to remember that you're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for your life. Mom and dad's not going to be there. Your husband and, and or wife won't be there. <coughs> it's going to be you and Jesus there. That's it. And you're going to give an account. Account for what? For what he did for you. What did he do for you? God stepped out of eternity into time and became a man to die on the cross for your sins and bore your sins, bore your hell on that cross and paid your eternal debt in full. And how did you treat Christ for doing that? Did you obey him? Were you fruitful in what you did? How you hear, don't be dull in hearing. It decays your growth. And then he says in verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, because of all these things, we don't want to be self-deceived. He said, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We have a tendency to be, are we swift to hear or swift to speak? All in favor of saying we talk too much, raise your hands. All in favor of saying we listen too much, raise your hands. We don't really listen about stuff or worry about what we listen to. You ever catch yourself wanting to talk and not listen to the other person? You want to give your perspective, you want to give your thoughts on something, and you're not taking it. <coughs> you know, he can't help it. Don't point at him. You're just not taking the opportunity to listen to the other person. Listening is an art, don't you think? We're so used to talking. We're so used to having our views met. Because after all, who's it about? It's all about me. It's all about us. So you need to hear what I have to hear. You know, I see this with pastors sometimes. You sit down with a pastor, and they begin to tell you all the things that are going on in your church. You can't get a word in edgewise to talk about your church because he's talking about what? His church. And what, would, what, what should he be doing? Is it wrong to talk about his church? I don't think so. But he should have a desire to do what? Listen. How God blesses other people. Isn't that an exciting thing? It's not about him. It's not about me. It's all about who? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so it says, be swift to hear. Swift to hear. We're not always swift to hear, are we? No. And then it says, slow to speak. And that's a natural thing, don't you think? You've got two ears and one mouth. What should win out? Yeah. In your case, maybe that's true, Jimmy. I don't know. But, you know, it's just a natural thing. I've got two ears, so I should listen twice as much as I speak. People need to hear you listen to them. People need that. When you come to church, you don't know what anybody's going through, true? Isn't it good sometimes just to sit there and listen to somebody? And not tell your story or what's going on in your life, though you probably want to, because there's some things in your life, too. But it's good from your perspective to, to listen to the other person. Be swift to hear first and be slow to speak and then slow to wrath. Well, what, what's that mean? Slow to wrath. How does that affect my spirituality, my spiritual walk? Well, we're talking about trials and tribulations, right? We're talking about temptations that come into our life. We're talking about spiritual maturity. Is it possible for you to get mad at God? You know? I think you know, I've heard people getting mad at God all the time. God doesn't seem to be fair sometimes, does he? And so a lot of times we can be, are we swift to hear? No, we got something to tell God. You read some of the Psalms. You know, he wants to know some things. Like, where are you at? But we can get mad at God for what he's brought into our life. And James says, be slow to wrath. You know, stand back. And let the spirit begin to work in your life as you fulfill those four imperatives. You're letting him work in your life. And then you're asking for wisdom. You know, how is this making me a better person? What's he doing to me? He says, if anyone lacks wisdom, God will give him wisdom. It's not something that God keeps away from you. He wants you to have wisdom. And so we have to be slow to wrath. 
And don't get mad at God. He has a purpose for everything he brings into your life. And so that's the first one that we talked about. This idea of uh, receiving God's word. The second one we can get into tonight just a little bit is practicing God's word. It's not enough just to, to hear God's word, but that's what we do a lot of time on Sundays, isn't it? You just hear God's word. But what good is it if you just hear it and you don't practice it? You've heard people say, you know, you know, revive us again, Lord. You know, wake up me, bring me closer to you, draw me nearer, nearer, precious Lord. We sing these songs all the time, but do we really want that? You know, we want what we want. Is that not true? Is that not right? I want to please who? Me. I have that desire all the time. And God sometimes will try to take me out of my comfort zone. I don't want to go. Do you? I like it here. I like it right where I am. But God will move you. And he'll bring things into your life to move you a little bit. You don't like it, but he'll move you. And so you have to remember that it's not enough just to hear the word of God. You have to practice it. Look what verse 22 says. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so again, you can be a deceiving you can deceive yourselves by what? Simply hearing the word of God and not doing the word of God. And so I think far too many Christians mark their Bibles. But they don't allow their Bibles to mark them. Does that make sense? You know, if you're in your Bible, it, it, because in the next verse he starts talking about this mirror thing. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. It's called liberty. The word of God is called liberty there because the word of God sets people free. That's what liberty is. And so we have a tendency to hear sermon after sermon after sermon. Did I say after sermon? And Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we hear it, we hear it, we hear it, but we don't practice it. We don't practice it. Why is that? How about your life? Do you practice the Word of God? Does God want you to make disciples? Does God want you to disciple somebody? Does God want you to lead someone to the Lord? Does God want you to be an ambassador? Sure He does. Then why don't we do that? What gets in the way? We deceive ourselves into thinking that we're what? We're good. We're right. Things are good. I came to church last month, didn't miss a service. I heard everything the preacher said, even came to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. But when that month is over and they look back at all the things that they should have got out of everything, what do they really have? They heard it. But it went in one ear, kind of out the other ear, and they didn't practice it. If you don't practice it, what good is it? Hmm? It's not good for anything. That's the idea here is. There's an examination he's talking about. You know? You glance at yourself in the mirror, and what are you supposed to see? Yourself. Again, we have all these religious exercises that we do as the denomination of Baptist. Methodists do their own, Presbyterians do their own. We have our own things too. Are they going to save you? Are they going to mature you? No. What matures you is the Spirit of God working in your life as you yield to the Spirit of God in your life. But here they, they look at and they glance into the mirror and they forget what they look like. Do you remember what you were like before you were saved? Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? He sees the Lord high and lifted up, sitting in the temple. And what does he do after he sees all this? Woe is me, he says, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, dwelling amongst an unclean people. Did he see himself as God saw himself? When you look into the word of God, you see yourself as God sees you. You can deceive yourself and just kind of shove that aside. Say, I'm good. I'm born again. I'm blood washed. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's great. But God didn't save you just to take you to heaven, did he? God didn't save you. That's not the purpose God saved you. God brought you into the kingdom of God for the purpose of what? Glorifying him. That's what church is. It's glorifying him. 
It's all about him, never about you, never about the church. It's always about him. We glorify him. We lift him up because that's why we're here. He saved us for that purpose. And so I need to be used. I'm a servant of God. I'm a slave of God. I have no rights. He's everything to me. That's Christianity. And I would say there's very few people in this world who practice true Christianity today. I hope we do, amen? hope you do. Because there's nothing sweeter than practicing what God tells us to do. So they look at the mirror, and it says, and they, they look at their natural face in the mirror, and then they go away, and they forget what kind of man he was. And so they fail to obey what the Word of God tells them to do because they don't see themselves through God's Word. You've heard me say many times that, should we spend time reading the Word of God? Yeah. And I can remember, and I've shared with you before, that one lady one time said, all you ever talk about is reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible. Yep. And maybe after, after a million times, one of those times, she'll get it. I don't know. It's not here. I don't know if she ever got it. But it's funny, isn't it? That somebody would say, all you do is talk about reading the Bible. Is that wrong? Not when you really understand it and you see it through the eyes of the Lord. And so there's an, ex there's an examination that needs to be made here if we're going to be true doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. And the second one that we see is restoration. And we're going to have to quit there because it's 730. I don't want to go late because people turn you off after so long. Some of you probably turned me off already. Shame on you. And, uh, you know, they give you to 12 o'clock, Ann, and that's it. You know, they give you to 730, and that's all I'm going to go. Uh, I'm glad. Clocks are heavy. <laughs> they didn't talk to him tonight. So, let's wrap this up a little bit. What did we learn tonight? God wants us to become spiritually mature people. You have to always fight against spiritual immaturity. Trials are good for you. Temptations are bad for you. It's how you handle those imperatives that make that temptation a victory or a defeat. We understand what sin is and how sin begins. And we see how important the Word of God is in our life. It's the Word of God that transforms us and changes us, that gives us hope. So we should be swift to hear it. We should allow the Word of God to control us in every aspect. And never get angry at God because something bad's come into your life. He's allowed it for a purpose. And there's nobody who loves you more than He does. You may not like it, but if it's a real bad thing, it's just a door where? Into His presence. Precious in the sight of the Lord of the death of his saints. So we're precious to him. He wants to bring us home, doesn't he? It's just a shame that we have to go through death. And so we need to pray, even so come Lord Jesus, and pray for the rapture of the church to come. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity that we've had. Thank you, Father, for just looking at a, really a hard book. And I just pray, Father God, that you would just help us to take the things that we've heard tonight and put them into our own lives, God, that we might see spiritual growth, 